Hi there, my name is Jim Truscott and I'm founder of Fundamental X. We created XBRL to Excel when it became apparent it was going to be less than straightforward to get XBRL to the point of analysis. For, that, for many that means Excel or a spreadsheet of some sort. XBRL presents many exciting new opportunities for company analysis. These opportunities are particularly pertinent for the retail investor. We've been working with the US SEC XBRL data and I'm going to use this data set along with our tools to demonstrate how retail investors can make better decisions based on these new possibilities in company analysis. So what are we going to cover? Well, we're going to look at the characteristics of retail investors. What is it that retail investors do? And we're going to look at the data access issues they currently face. And how does XBR help? Well, we're going to look at that via some examples, and then I will conclude. So thinking about retail investors, when we say retail investors, we mean also individual investors or private investors, that's sometimes what they're called. And we're looking um, at retail investors who buy or sell on their own account, i.e. they invest directly in companies rather than in funds. And in order to make decisions about which companies to invest in, they need to do some form of analysis. And in that respect, their aspirations are no different to professional investors. In fact, in some respects, they have an advantage in that they are not encumbered by house rules or compliance res restrictions, which means they have to go about their analysis in a set way. They can do whatever they like, and in my experience, they're very willing to apply that analysis and do very sophisticated things in terms of, for example, using macros in Excel to trawl through large reams of data to uh, reveal uh, opportunities and hidden value that otherwise may not have been seen. So before XBRL came along, and I'm looking at the US SEC data here, what was available to retail investors? Well, they could pick up the 10K or 10Q in HTML format from Edgar. They could also go to a company's website and maybe look at a report with better navigation and perhaps even get the financial statements exported directly into Excel. That's great for looking at individual companies, but if you're going to do any kind of serious form of analysis, you're going to need to compare the company you're interested in against others. And that's where retail investment portals like Yahoo or Google come in, which are free, and the data is invariably sourced from third-party data vendors. They have a number of weaknesses in that they often have low levels of detail. The data, the data may be summarized, um, or the coverage is restricted, so not every listed company is available. The updates potentially can be slow, because often the data is being uh, transcribed from a report into a database, and that takes time. If the data is summarized or normalized, then it may be difficult to verify the quality, simply because if the data is opaque and you can't actually see where it's come from. In order to get the detail that will enable you to do that, you invariably have to pay for premium content, the cost of which is invariably extremely prohibitive. So there's some real dangers here. Uh, retail investors may well be misled because they're looking at summarized or misleading data. When they are looking at a small a sample of companies, for example, if they want to look at anything in detail, they're only going to have time to look at a small sample of companies, and so that any kind of in-depth analysis is limited to a very small set of data, which means, again, that they're perhaps not seeing the full picture of what's going on in the whole investment market. And hence why they have relied historically a lot on investment intermediaries or financial advisors in order to decide which companies to invest in. So XBRL makes a massive difference in this respect. Suddenly we have a lot more detail. Again, looking at the US SEC data, every item in the financial statements and in the notes is available as tagged data. Every company listed in the US is required to file XBRL. And that data is made available immediately that the company files that XBRL tag data. So you can immediately start analysis at the point at which it's available to everyone else. Accuracy should be good, and I emphasize the word should, um, because the data is coming directly from the company itself. But we'll come back to that in a minute. Transparency, because you've got all the detail, it's possible to see what any data item is made up of. And also, because you have links built into the XBRL, you can see exactly where that data has come from 
in the reports. Because again, you've got all the detail, you can choose how you create your own key performance indicators. You can combine the data in whatever way you want um, to get to those values. And thinking about XBRL across the world, built into XBRL is the capability to be able to create one report, but to have it available in several different languages at the same time. By the use of labels, it's possible for a data item to be tagged in many different languages. And of course, the, the one thing I, I really want to emphasize is that because XBRL, certainly in the case of the US, is free at the point at which it is filed, that is a, a massive game changer as far as uh, retail investment is concerned. I want to hone in on the detail. Because of this detail, it means that we can disaggregate the data. And by that, I mean we no longer just have to look at the key performance indicators, look at revenue, look at operating profit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and guess what's driving them, because we can now see the detail, we can see uh, a, a better breakdown of costs and also revenues, so we get a better understanding of what is going to be driving the top level performance in the future. There are a few caveats we need to bear in mind. XBRL is coded in XML, and that does mean it's difficult to look at, frankly, and uh, so you need a tool to be able to do that. Fortunately, the likes of ourselves and a number of other providers provide free tools that enable you to access the underlying data behind the XBRL XML. The quality is uh, a slight issue as far as tagging is concerned. Um, certainly in the US, what has happened is that the tagging process has become a, a, a or started off as a secondary process in that the information was prepared uh, first um, and then it was tagged afterwards. And therefore, it, it, it hasn't previously had the attention that uh, perhaps it should have had. And so that's caused a, a number of problems. Thankfully, uh, the SEC and XBR, XBRL US are spending a lot of time with filers to improve the quality of the tagging to make sure it's as accurate as possible. So that's, uh, that's changing dramatically. Yes, all the tags are standardized. But what you need to bear in mind is that a company is not required to use all of the tags. So you might be trying to find a particular subtotal and find it's not there. Um, because the company is not obliged to put in every single subtotal. And so you need to be aware that you may need to roll the data up yourself. And it doesn't replace existing sources. I mean, obviously, you, you still need to look at the reports to understand the context from which the data has come from, and also any commentary that the company provides alongside it. It's, uh, there is a danger with XBRL to say, well, it, because it's the official data presented by the company itself, to say, OK, well, it's, it's going to be right. I don't need to check it. I don't need to go back and, and see where it's come from. And as I've emphasized already, you know, there, there are potential areas where the data may not be as you expect it to be. And so you need to guard against complacency. Um, there has been some research done to suggest that um, that is what potentially can happen, is that uh, people start to think, OK, this data is absolutely fine, so I'm not going to bother to check it from where it's come from. Now I'm going to have a look at a couple of examples. And the first example I'm going to look at is using one of our tools, XBRL to Excel. So we're sitting in Excel here. Um, and uh, our tool has downloaded a lot of XBRL data into the filing tabs that you can see basically at the back of this sheet. We are in the model tab. And we have uh, a metric here, debt equity. And you can see how it's made up of, uh, of three components. And we can see if we go to the next slide, that uh, equity, um, or debt to be more precise, is split down into short-term and long-term debt, uh, which is great. It's great to be able to see that. Um, but with XBRL, we can go further than that. We might have been able to go that far with um, uh, one of the existing tools, like Yahoo or Google. But with um, XBRL, we can now see a lot more detail. We can see, for example, what the breakdown of long-term debt is in year two, three, four, and five. So we've got a much better idea of the um, exposures as far as repayments are concerned for this particular company, which is Boeing in this instance. And because all the data is connected, it is possible to drill down through the data in this way. As well as having a lot more detail, which enables to do us, uh, the kind of things that I was just showing you, um, having a lot of detail going effectively down the data set, we can also go across the data set in new ways where previously we wouldn't have been able to do because the XBRL has added a lot of dimensional data. The data is now available in, in multiple dimensions. And we have a tool called Sector Free, which takes advantage of this by looking at the different uh, sectors 
that a company operates in. Uh, sector Pre basically looks at all the different business segments um, and enables us to do some interesting things with that. So I'm looking at the defense sector here. And what we're going to do is basically create a, a quasi defense sector based on the uh, the four largest uh, or four of the larger uh, defense contractors. So what we can do is we can choose those companies as I've done here, um, and that will bring up all the different segments in which they operate. Um, and using this uh, picker on the right, we can select what these sectors actually translate to. So um, what I've gone through and done is basically said, right, okay. This is aerospace, this is aerospace, this is information systems, et cetera, et cetera. So I've just classified them into two different sectors here so that we can look at those sectors in more detail. Uh, and once we've done that classification, which is very uh, simple and easy to do, we can then download the data into Excel. And if we look at the uh, codes highlighted in red, 3364, that's the NIC code for the aerospace sector, we can see that all of this information has been coded according to its sectors and also one of the things we've also done is we've standardized the data. I was talking before about how the subtotals might be missing. Well, as part of Sector 3, what we do is we roll that data up so that you always have those uh, subtotals available so that you always have the key performance indicators you need to look at. So that's effectively the raw data. Um, when you're looking at data with many different dimensions, one really useful tool to use are pivot tables. And so that's what we've done. We have looked at uh, some pivot tables, we've created some pivot tables that enables us to look at this data in two different ways. On this first tab, we can look at the various different sectors that uh, are, are, <coughs> we have created. In this case, we are looking again at the aerospace sector, 3364. So here, generated from these pivot tables are the sales growth, profit margin, and return on assets. So that's quite interesting to look at it from a sector perspective, but we can also look at it from an individual company perspective to see how they perform against this sector. So I'm looking at Boeing here, and we can see that its sales growth, profit margin, and return on assets are above the sector average, but not doing quite as well as Lockheed Martin, the company below it, where we can see, for example, a return on assets of nearly 28%. Now that's the kind of analysis you can do with XBRL you know, relatively easily. You know, this is just using a raw XBRL data, our tool combined with some of the power that you've got within Excel to do new sorts of analysis which previously would have been impossible to do because of the time involved or the cost in order to create this kind of analysis. So the opportunities are there and those opportunities are particularly tailor-made for retail investors. Probably the, one of the most important things in that respect is the cost. We're looking at being able to have access to data at a mere fraction of what it previously would have cost to do the kind of analysis that I've just shown you just now. We do need to bear in mind the quality, as I said, the transparency is inbuilt into XBRL to enable you to examine the data where it's come from to ensure that you are looking at the numbers you're expecting to see. The tools are at an early stage of development, but I am very confident that we will soon have tools that will enable the retail investors to do exactly the same kind of analysis as a professional investor, but at a fraction of the cost. If you're interested in any of the tools I've shown you today, then feel free to visit our website, xbrlxl.com, and thank you for listening. <laughs>